going back and applying those solutions. So I can't think of a more appropriate speaker. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, Sri Ram. It's uh, <laughs> nice to be here. I think the last time I visited this department was about 1982 or 83. I took the train down from uh, Boston, and the department fit in a small house somewhere on campus. And I <laughs> guess things have grown, which is uh, a good thing. I thought, given the occasion, I'd say a few words about uh, Paris and my uh, friendship with him. This is Paris and his two children who were uh, coincidentally the same age as my daughter and son. And we visited them in Greece uh, in 1995 and had a very nice uh, visit there. The kids all were friends uh, and so on. And, and Paris was my friend in graduate school and for, for several years uh, after that. Uh, he and his family were killed on my 40th birthday. So I got a call in the morning thinking it was somebody wishing me happy birthday. And it, turned out to be something very different. But one of the things I've taken away from that is every year I have a birthday, and every year I could lament having a little less hair or something like that. But uh, actually, this has given me a good uh, reason to be glad I'm still here. So I think of this in a way as a, uh, his death, although however tragic, although tragic, also reminds me every year that I'm uh, glad to be alive and. Uh, not to feel too badly about things that have gone wrong. Uh, I thought I'd say a little bit about uh, two papers that we worked on together. One was uh, a symbolic computation problem looking at unification. And in both these cases, he was really instrumental in identifying a problem which, as Sri Ram mentioned, was an application of theory to uh, some practical question of the day. Here, there was the Japanese fifth generation project uh, that was going to change the world by uh, using a concurrent prologue everywhere. And so we thought, well, how much concurrency is there in prologue? And we thought, well, at the lowest level, you're doing unification in every step in prologue. Could unification be uh, parallelized? And if so, would that be more efficient? And the outcome of this was several failed attempts to pres uh, develop concurrent unification algorithms, followed by a proof that, uh, according to uh, normal complexity theory, uh, that's not possible. And the second paper had to do with type inference for uh, a programming language called ML, and just generally the idea of inferring properties of programs using uh, unification-based methods. And here I've been working in this area for several years, and Paris said, isn't there something we could do together that's algorithmic? And I said, well, there's nothing algorithmic about this. It's a different kind of field. And he's kind of pressed on and said, well, what about the complexity of this? And I said, well, everybody knows it's linear. <laughs> and uh, it turns out it's not. It's exponential time complete. There's more of a story here in that uh, Paris and I wrote one paper and sort of in the process of shipping it, came up with a pro uh, an example right as the paper went out to publication to sort of illustrate one aspect of the problem. But we you know, shipped the paper, and that was right out of mind. And then Harry Marison wrote another paper, and then he got stuck somewhere along the way uh, on his paper. And I said, well, remember that example we uh, cooked up at midnight? Maybe if you look at that example, it'll help. And that turned out to be kind of the core of this proof that uh, this problem was exponential space hard. So this led to a three-author three paper. And and these were both uh, fun examples of work that had some theoretical component. They were basically as fun to work on from a theoretical standpoint as anything else around, but they're also aimed at answering uh, kind of questions uh, of the day. So moving on, I'd like to talk a little bit about web security just generally, and then a particular problem that I've been working on with collaborators for the last year or year and a half having to do with JavaScript and understanding how JavaScript programs work, and then applying some theoretical techniques, which are basically traditional from programming language theory, to answering questions about security on the web. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit generally about web security and uh, point to uh, you know our website as uh, sort of some place to get started if you're interested. 
We have a security lab at Stanford that uh, Dan Bonet and I organized, uh, uh, and we have courses and seminars and so on, and links to sort of pages on particular topics. We've been working on web security for six or seven years, starting with problems in identity theft and phishing prevention, moving on to aspects of the browser and the web application execution platform. And then there are several of our papers on JavaScript are, are listed among their in a particular section. So if you want to read further, uh, that's the place to, to look. So I want to try to uh, situate the work I'm going to talk about in more detail in comparison with other problems in web security. So one kind of web threat that people w wonder about and, and are concerned about is you take your browser and you visit a bad site. Well, what could happen to you as a result of visiting a bad site? One class of problems arises from implementation errors in the systems you use. So there could be a buffer overflow attack against your web browser exploiting a kind of program error in the development of the software you're running that allows a bad site to install malware, worms, viruses, other things that compromise your computer. That's one class of vulnerabilities, implementation problems. There are a great many problems that are not like that, but are really malicious use of intended features of the web. And that's the more, that's the area that our group has focused in more. Uh, given that the web is supposed to do good things, how do those features that let people do good things also enable uh, bad things to happen? A little bit of a few slides about this. There are some things that, that visiting a bad site can do to you directly. There's kind of limited crossover. There's a basic principle in web security called the same origin policy, content that comes from one website. If you visit CNN or your bank, and then you visit you know, some attacker's website, the attacker has limited connection to your bank transaction through uh, various mechanisms that are implemented in the browser. One line of work we've done, but I'm not going to talk about today, is how well does the browser do that? It's like operating system isolation and protection. There's a class of problems there. Let me just say a little bit. Here's a like, very fundamental thing, simplest thing possible to talk about, is since the beginning, websites have had pictures. If you told somebody that pictures are a security risk, we're going to have to remove images from all websites, you would never get anywhere. And the way a picture is embedded in a page is there's a little piece of HTML saying, go get this picture from someplace else. And that sounds like a, you know, it's a feature we will not remove anytime soon. But this in itself has some security implications and it's kind of a, a useful or interesting starting point. So what can go wrong here? First of all, I think the most basic thing, there's no way to prevent export of information by uh, a malicious web page. Anything that a page has access to can be sent any place in the world just by putting that information kind of as the name of the picture you're looking for. So we're not going to be at any kind of web security effort in the business of trying to control export of sensitive information. The fact that a page is doing this can be hidden. A little image that doesn't exist could be made very small so you don't notice it. There are also other uses of images that have to do with fooling users. That's where phishing and other problems go in. But the main point I wanted to make at the beginning is anything that your JavaScript or other content running in your browser discovers about you or your friends or your web browser or your platform, it can send any place else easily just by this basic feature that we're not going to get rid of because the, pro the, the idea of removing pictures from web pages is, is not going to go anywhere. Another thing that JavaScript can do very easily is if you're sitting behind a firewall, access all the other computers behind the firewall and see what's running there. Very, 